to imagine that you are recovering from a heart attack. You are at home thinking about the large scar on your heart. Now, imagine your frustration when you find out that there is a new drug that can reduce heart scarring by more than 50%. But you cannot use this drug. It was discovered in a university and never progressed to human studies. This, unfortunately, happens all the time. Although the U.S. government provides about $30 billion in support for medical research in academia, many discoveries never benefit patients. So why did this new heart attack drug never reach patients? I can tell you about it because it happened in my own lab. In 2000, our lab discovered a novel inhibitor that can reduce infarct size by more than 50% after heart attack or stroke when given to multiple animal models. Because of its potential to benefit patients, the university wrote patents about it. I published the work. I presented it in multiple international conferences. I even gave it to other researchers who found similar effects. And then, Nothing happened. I then traveled and presented the, origin, the idea to big pharmaceutical companies. But none were interested. Our idea didn't fit the way they thought about drugs for heart attack. And despite this unequivocal animal data that we had, I could not convince these companies to test our drug further. So, out of frustration, one of my students said, OK, so we should start a drug company. And that is why we founded Kai Pharmaceuticals. I took a year of absence from the university and started to work as a chief scientific officer in the company. But now, surrounded by industry people, I realize that I know nothing about drug development. There is a huge knowledge gap between academia and industry. And equally disturbing, there is a huge cultural disconnect. Academicians see the industry as mundane, not creative. And industry people see academicians, like myself, as not thorough enough. The biggest problem, though, is the knowledge gap. It is hard to believe. But skills that are required for drug development are rarely taught in academia. In fact, nothing in my own years as a researcher and as a student have prepared me for the knowledge that is required for drug development. And let me tell you from experience, the know-how is not intuitive. So after a year at the company, I returned to my position at the university but I continued to spend a day a week at the company. Now, driving back and forth between Palo Alto and South San Francisco, I kept thinking about this chasm between the academia and industry. The academia, the innovative discovery machine, and the industry is a sophisticated drug development machine. So how can we close this gap? To do that, Scientists from both worlds need to work more closely together. I decided to do something about it, and that is why I've established SPARC. SPARC is a university program that provides hands-on training in what is now called translational research. The objective of translational research is to accelerate the transformation of academic discoveries to FDA-approved drugs and treatment. For the past nine years, two groups of scientists have been working together every Wednesday night. A group of academicians, professors, postdocs and students, and a group of industry experts and executives. Together, we work on two dozen projects at a time. The work includes identifying critical experiments that will confirm the original observation, generating proof-of-concept studies in animals, designing the development path for the drug, and when possible, 
setting up small clinical studies. So far, 64 projects have completed the training in our program. 30 of those entered human clinical studies. Our program helped launch 22 startup companies, and seven of the projects that we work on were licensed to existing companies. So if you sum all of that together, this is a success rate of 57%. 57% far exceeds the 10 to 20% success of the industry. So how come our program is so successful? The secret sauce has five ingredients. Multiple voices on a university campus, open exchange, ongoing, and sharing failures. Let's start with the first one, multiple voices. We never rely on one expert's advice. This may sound simple, but we oftentimes have to pause and insist that other advisors will provide their opinion. This way, no advice is given unequivocally. This is very different from what often happens in startup companies, where the budgetary constraints forces this company to rely on one expert's advice. And let me tell you, one expert's bad advice can derail a great program. Second, we meet on a university campus. Our idea is not about setting an incubator where a single inventor is surrounded by industry experts and is separated away from her or his academic colleagues. In our program, multiple inventors from academia are working together, absorbing the advice from the industry experts while keeping the out-of-the-box thinking of academia. Open exchange. This should not come as a shocker to anyone. If you want people to cooperate, you bring them into one room and you give them some food. <laughs> this is how we created this intellectual hub where multiple voices are offered, heated arguments are welcome, and we do not try to reach a consensus. It is up to the inventor to weigh the options and reach a conclusion. The fourth ingredient is ongoing. The continual commitment of the same advisors and uh, academicians to the program, showing up every Wednesday night, creates this culture that is unique to the program. And for the final ingredient, sharing success. Our industry experts share lessons learned from past failures. They do not reveal their company's secret. Their stories are not detailed. But the lessons learned from these past failures are immediately applied to our program. So the program is so successful because of what the two groups are bringing to the table. First, the academicians. The academicians are not burdened by the know-how of how difficult drug development is. They bring this out-of-the-box thinking, innovative uh, spirit, risk-taking, cutting-edge science, and very high motivation to transform these discoveries to benefit patients. But without a doubt, the success of the program is largely due to our industry experts who come every Wednesday night, year after year, providing free advice, researching topics on our behalf, and all of it without being paid and while keeping it all confidential. In our first year, we had five advisors. Now we have over 90. So far, 64 projects have completed the program, 30 of which entered clinical trial, 22 led to the startup companies, and seven projects have been uh, licensed to existing companies. As you can imagine, 
The stories of those uh, cases are still mainly confidential, but I can tell you two. The first is that of Dr. Al Lane. He's a pediatric dermatologist who was part of a team that was treating a very young girl with a large mass that was inside her chest. This deforming and sometimes life-threatening mass was pushing on her lungs. To help her, she was given Viagra to relax the blood vessels and help with her lung functions. Dr. Lane noticed that over time, this huge mass was shrinking dramatically. He was then interested to determine whether other children with this life-threatening and very rare disease can benefit from this treatment. We helped him design the clinical study, which led the FDA to fund it, and then eventually was the results of the study were published, and now this treatment is, is used elsewhere. No money was made, but the lives of these children were greatly benefiting. The second story is that of a neuroscientist, Dr. Craig Garner. He discovered a way he thought can help people with Down syndrome learn and retain better what they learn. Industry rejected his appeal to develop this drug. They did not see the economic uh, um, market for such a drug. We helped him develop his uh, preclinical work, which led to him starting a company, which is now at the end of phase two clinical trial. Dr. Garner is most proud of the fact that now two big pharmaceutical companies have a competing program to his. He feels that no matter who wins the race, the life of, uh, and, and the quality of life of these patients will improve. So let's come back to the companies that my student and I started to reduce scar tissue after heart attack. As often happens, the original program changed direction. With lots of innovative and creative work that the company did, it was transformed to a new drug for patients on kidney di dialysis. The company was then sold. This new drug successfully completed phase three clinical trial, and it's now in front of the FDA for final approval. Knowing that the dollar of the original program is on its way to benefit patients is just so immensely gratifying. So to increase the chance that more academic discoveries end up benefiting patients, the missing element is a closer work and collaboration between industry and academia. I'm not talking about a money handout from industry to academia. The idea here is an ongoing open exchange with multiple experts in one room on a university campus. It is so simple, but it is so effective. I'm happy to tell you that uh, this program is now picked up in more than two dozen uh, universities throughout the world. In Taiwan, in Australia, in Japan, in Brazil, in Germany, and several universities also in the US. As I see it, all of us in this movement are in the rescue business. We are rescuing lost academic discoveries that uh, can benefit both uh, rare and common diseases. We provide hope to patients, to their families. We are rescuing lost economic opportunities. And maybe we are also rescuing some of the original spirit of what science of medicine is supposed to be? Thank you.